Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Jonas. I'm the Director of Communications with the National Association for Business Economics. We're pleased to present today's event. Uh, before we start, I did want to mention, uh, save the date for the upcoming NABE Economic Policy Conference, which will be taking place March 20th through 22nd at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Washington, D.C., arranged around the theme, Policy Options for Sustainable and Inclusive Growth. Also, NABE's job board is econjobs.org, where economists and businesses meet. You can head over to econjobs.org right now. To look for your next qualified candidate if you're an employer or for your next dream job. Now, on to today's event. Uh, note that we'll be taking questions through the Q&A box throughout the discussion. If you have a question for the panel at any time, go ahead and enter that in the Q&A. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event. Chad Moutre is Chief Economist with the National Association of Manufacturers and a former board member of NABE. Chad, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> and uh, speaking of dream jobs, this is a great, uh, a great panel today. Uh, we have uh, Carlos Herrera from Coca-Cola, Elaine Buckberg from General Motors, and Jan Hoff Hagreif uh, from um, Boeing. So. Uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we are doing in the manufacturing sector as economists. And so this is uh, when you're studying economics, hopefully many of you are thinking about where you're going to go and land and, and manufacturing is obviously a great career. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing myself uh, and where I went to school uh, and then, I'll, then we'll go through the panelists and we'll just have a nice discussion after that. Um, so I got my PhD from Southern Illinois University uh, in Carbondale in 1996. Uh, from there, I went on and became a business dean, a fairly young age, uh, at a, a, a School of Business at Robert Morris College in Chicago, which is now actually part of Roosevelt University. Uh, uh, and then I, I decided public policy was my avenue and moved to Washington, D.C. in 2002, where I became chief economist at the Small Business Administration, which is where I was when I was on the NAB board. Uh, and for the last 10 plus years, I've been chief economist at the National Association of Manufacturers and also straddle over onto the Manufacturing Institute, uh, where I run the Center for Manufacturing Research. So that's a quick little thumbnail version of what, I am, what I've done in my career. And I'm going to turn it over to Elaine to talk about um, what you, where you have been uh, before landing at General Motors. So I earned my PhD in economics at MIT and I went straight into, I have to say the job I, I thought I'd go into when I graduated from high school, uh, which I started as an economist at the IMF. Uh, I was there for about five years. It's, it's fascinating, but I wanted to learn more about the capital markets. So I spent a couple of years at Morgan Stanley in New York, and then uh, about a dozen years in consulting at near economic consulting focused on finance. Came back to Washington to serve in the Obama administration treasury uh, in the Office of Economic Policy where I was deputy assistant secretary for policy coordination. Uh, went back into consulting briefly at the Brattle Group and joined GM in 2018 as chief economist. Great. Um, uh, now we're going to go to Carlos. What about Coca-Cola? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Chad. Uh, well, I got my master's degree from Georgia Tech in industrial and systems engineering. So I'm an engineer by, by training and uh, some way or somewhere along the line, I went to the dark side and became an economist. Uh, uh, what you get good at Georgia Tech is developing mathematical models. And uh, at some point in time, uh, the president of our division asked me to understand how the business was going to evolve into the future. And one of the big drivers of what, how the business performs, of course, the economic environment in which it functions. And so I had to uh, get myself acquainted and learn in, in all the magic potions and tricks of economists so that I can figure that out. And, and um, after a long time, I became the chief economist uh, and the first chief economist for the Coca-Cola company. Before that, I worked for a while uh, at Federal Express Corporation doing uh, engineering work, but that's, that's me. 
right? Uh, engineering and math skills are, are, are essential there. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second. And Jan, what about Boeing? Uh, what do you, tell us about your story. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm currently at Boeing. Uh, I'm the director of market analysis and the chief economist for the commercial airplanes division. Um, and I started that about seven years ago, um, not as a director of market analysis, but at Boeing. Um, and my, my path there might be a little unusual one. I, I grew up in Germany. I'm, I'm from there. I, I uh, went to school there, um, went to the University of Tübingen um, and did all my, my uh, graduate work there as well. Did have the opportunity to study abroad one time at um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo during my undergraduate and then uh, at the University of San Diego. University of California, San Diego, and uh, for graduate studies, which which was great. And then um, back in Germany, I went to the Center for European Economic Research, a think tank. I worked there mostly on you know, macroeconomics and um, forecasting and also international trade. Um, and after that, after about six years, I went to uh, to Boeing. So tell me, Jan, while we have you on the screen here, tell me what you do. I mean, so uh, how do you use economics at Boeing? What are you, what are you forecasting? What are you looking at? Um, to this, you know, when, when, you, when you meet someone at a party and they, and they say, what do you do? What, what, what do you do uh, at, at Boeing? And, and how does that relate to, to going into economics? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, that, that could fill the whole um, webinar, but I'll, I'll try to um, put it in a, in a few general remarks, I mean, it's Boeing is a manufacturing company, right? So we make airplanes and, and we sell airplanes. Um, it's not a bank or a research institution. So the economist role is a supporting role. And it's a supporting role in the way that it helps um, company leadership and also other market participants understand um, the business environment. That, that our industry is in, that's how we call it. And so there are a lot of economic influences on um, say the demand for travel or the demand for air freight, which then in turn influences the demand for airplanes. And so that's what our job is as a team. We look at these drivers, we look at economic growth, um, both globally, but also on a regional or country basis. We look at um, consumers, how, what position they're in, what spending trends we can observe, um, how they travel. You know, we look at other indicators, um, exchange rates are important, oil prices. So really a whole host of macroeconomic variables that we have to be on top of and then translate their meaning into, you know, actionable insights for, for our company and our, and our other partners and, and customers in the market. So what is your time horizon? I, I know that you and I have talked before, you know, Boeing has orders over the next five, 10 years, right? So what, what is your time horizon when you're doing a forecast? What are you looking at? So it's, it's, um, it's everything from between the next few weeks, you know, when we're talking about say, you know, new travel restrictions in light of a new variant that's emerging, we need to have an assessment of that in a way, um, what that means for, for traffic data that's coming in and how to interpret that. But we're also contributing to a forecast that goes out 20 years. And because, um, we are in a very long cycle business. Airplanes stay around for a while and decisions you make now um, will have implications for, for decades. That said, though, the near term to me is always important, too, because these decisions are made in a certain business environment, right, under certain influencing conditions. And making sure everybody understands those correctly, helping them understand them and interpret what these economic and, and other business environment conditions mean is really important for the long run. But yeah, we do have everything um, in market analysis. We have a, a medium and near-term forecast and also long-term. Yeah, great. And Elaine, you, you've had a very, this has been a challenging year, a couple of years really for, for the auto sector, um, certainly with all of the supply chain issues and all the other, you know, COVID-19 and everything else. How, how are economists being used uh, at General Motors? Uh, what, what, are you, what do you do uh, as far as forecasting? Very similar to, to Jan, very long time horizons, but also global, you know, both of you global in nature. First of all, GM is deeply institutionalized going back many decades using economics in all kinds of decision-making. And so it's, it's well broader than forecasting. And it's worth noting that my responsibilities are well broader as well. So in addition to running a team of about seven economists who do both macroeconomics, 
microeconomics and and sort of highly quantitative uh, econometric machine learning analysis. Obviously, different people with different responsibilities. I run a big a bigger team. Uh, of people who do long-term forecasting of segments and vehicles and industry analysis. So GM uses, first of all, there is forecasting. We um, we provide forecasts out 10 years. Uh, the economists do industry, you know, ec- national and then uh, industry sales in different countries. Uh, we cover a wide range of countries that are GM markets. My long-term forecasters also forecast again segments think full-size truck and individual vehicles within those and that also looks out 10 years we do a lot of analysis uh, providing intuition about what's going on in the economy what the direction is how policy can impact it um, to help guide our leadership and other people and having that more nuanced understanding we're pretty popular internal speakers we are involved in all sorts of strategic and policy uh, processes that are figuring out how we we think about a potential policy or an actual new policy or thinking about strategic questions and bringing that to bear. We bring to bear economic research data um, as well as good thinking on different questions. And I like to say that we, we build the credibility that if there's a research question that doesn't involve science or engineering, it's likely to land in my inbox. Um, and I, I like to keep it that way, actually. Although anything that's too far afield, we wouldn't. But we, we look at foreign exchange markets, commodities markets, um, energy markets. There's a, just a huge range of issues, but it's always fun and exciting and changing um, yeah. and certainly challenging. Nice. Fre- it's always fresh, right? Because there's always something new coming across your desk. So, Carlos, uh, when you think of iconic brands, Coca-Cola, right, and thinking of the consumer, uh, have you got into the mind of the consumer? Uh, and what do you what do you do uh, as an economist at Coca-Cola? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, you know, it's whenever you do one of these things, you're always learning. And and I really love uh, listening to both uh, Elaine and, and Jan in the sense of how do they look at their job and their function on the on the company. Uh, of course, the life cycle of a Coca-Cola is extremely short compared to a Boeing <laughs> airplane or, or a car. And, and so uh, uh, the short term, the immediate term in terms of the manufacturing, it is pretty much uh, set up in stone and deterministic in the sense that we have so many orders that we have to fulfill. You have the production plan and and there's a whole team that that does that. Uh, For me, the most important thing is, is how the business is connected to that world out there. Okay. Uh, Coca-Cola is a marketing company. And, and, and uh, honestly, we believe that, that if you just spend more money in marketing, that that's going to change the world and, and, and make a difference for the business. But it, it is very important for us to understand the, the condition of that consumer uh, that ultimately buys our products. And, and how can we understand uh, how is that going to change? as the conditions in which the consumer lives changes. Uh, um, f- for me internally and specifically, you know, the forecast that I do is usually about a year to five years out. And, and I don't go any, any much longer than that. Um, we have a, a, a much smaller team. Uh, it's, it's actually a team of one. Uh, and that's me. And, and so I don't have the capability or the team to do forecastings for inflation and, and other things. And I depend on some other people to do this. Um, but it's critical then, given that, because all of our executives hear about inflation, unemployment, and all of these things. Okay? But what does it mean for the business? That's the critical part that I see as my job. Not only for us internally, but for our customers as well. How can we help them understand what does it mean if interest rates go 1%? What does it mean 
for the business. Okay, what's the impact going to be? And, and that's where it's critical to have uh, the economics so that you have a framework uh, on which to think about this section. That's great. I, I'm a chief and only economist as well, Carlos. So we're 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 in, we're in, in good company here. In good company. Uh, so uh, so go back uh, again since you're on the screen here, Carlos. I'm going to ask this to you. Um, so go back to your college self, right? Uh, you're but you're in college. Uh, you're taking economics. What do you wish you could tell yourself? Looking at your career and where you are now, what what should you have focused on that you didn't focus on, or or what 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 are some traits that you that you wish you knew then? Um, now knowing what you do at Coca Cola. Okay, thank you, and and uh, it's a great question because I will answer not so much in what I wish I would have done, but what as a matter of fact helped me the most. And for all of the audience, you know, we are a little bit more advanced in years, particularly probably me. And, and uh, back in the day, we didn't have cell phones or even for that PCs. And, but one of the things that has helped me the most in my career is the ability to manipulate data. Uh, whether it was on a mainframe with, you know, punch cards and all kinds of crazy things back in the day, to, to nowadays with the web and all of this really ocean of data that we have out there. The more capable you are to, uh, to manipulate and extract information out of that data, the better off you're gonna be. So to me, that is one of the most important things that you can do to help yourself in your career and the whole thing. I mean, that is uh, a, a minimum that you have to have, that it should be, a non-issue for you that you have a huge pile of data and, and to do something with it. You see, it, they, and I will take this opportunity to, to clarify what I, why I think the difference in between a data scientist and an economist is. The data scientist can manipulate the data and get and produce a beautiful uh, dashboard for you. But what does it mean? Okay, and on which framework does he think about the results of, of his analysis. That's where being an economist, I think, is better than just being a data scientist is because you have a framework in which to think about this data. And I think that that's the really important thing. And why we'll encourage uh, to, to, to our audience is that the, the more tools you have, uh, it is it's the better. The more data tools that you have at your disposal, the better. Uh, I, I agree. Jan, I'm going to ask the same question to you. So if you were to go back to your college self in Germany, I guess, uh, what, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I think um, Carlos hit, hit some really important points. It's um, the, the, the ability to look at data is really important. And so, you know, taking, if you think about, say, an applied econometrics class, right, really learning how to think of, about influences uh, on your data, how to extract causality from data. And even if you're not necessarily doing that on a day-to-day -day basis in a business uh, world, in, in your job in a manufacturing company, the, the basics from that, the way to think about, you know, what, what certain movements in the data mean or what questions you need to ask yourself before you make big statements based on some statistic that you're seeing, right? That's important. And that's something I think... Um, people can really, really uh, focus on. Now, in terms of theory, I don't wanna um, downplay that part because there are things you don't have data on, right? There are things that go out in the future. And, you know, it's, my advice would be for people, you know, always try to find ways to make it come alive for you. Look at, you know, how could that theory be applied? Where is it applied? What would it say? Um, I personally sometimes had a hard time just doing fundamentals only, right? Theory, math, and everything. But it is important. Um, but it, it always helped me. And, you know, thinking back all those years, it's really find an application um, and then study that. It, sometimes it could be historical. Um, sometimes it could be current policy. Just have discussions with your peers, with your professors, you know, um, and, and just make it applicable, you know. Professors sometimes just do it, the theory piece because honestly, if you're in academia, you write papers about the theory, right? That's kind of what you work on. You try to really refine it to the max. 
you're not doing that in, in, in as a business economist. So you need that part where you're saying maybe it's okay to go 90% of the way, but really understand that framework, you know, because the speed with which questions come to you sometimes in a business world, you know, it's exciting, but it can also be, be challenging. And then you need to have a framework to fall back on, right? At least, you know, the guardrails of what you're going to say. And that's, I think, um, important for consistency. So it's both, I think it's huge. Data is, is really important. So applied econometrics, but then also theory in a way that it gives you a, a guideline for, for when you don't have the data. Great, great. Uh, Elaine, uh, same question for you. And, and I guess probably like, like, like you, I, I mentor a lot of up and coming economists and I always have to answer the same, same question. So what advice would you give to a mentoring a college student or an up and coming economist? Very similar question, but. Um, yeah, that's an easier question. I'll take that yeah. one. <laughs> so, great comments so far. So first of all, what, what makes you powerful using economics in, in the workplace, whether or not your title is economist? So one is the sort of logical rigor, not, well, I think this, but like I can explain to you what are all the logical steps to get from current circumstances founded by data to my conclusion? very persuasive. Secondly, it's that hypothesis testing mindset, not just let me like show you all the things that support my conclusion, but let me also be thinking about everything that and, and mindful of everything that calls into question that conclusion, even if I'm not like doing a statistical test, because that means that if you apply that test to yourself, you'll, you'll calibrate, you'll nuance, and you'll reject ideas when you need to. Um, I like uh, Jan's econometrics reference that uh, awareness, first of all, that, um, you know, the idea that there, there are real standards for what's, what's a, um, a, a factor that's correlated or has causation, that there can be multiple different causes, but, um, I don't think economists often say, oh, there are myriad causes or a multiplicity of causes, which to me always says, well, there's, there's so many I haven't bothered to figure out which ones are important. So that econometrics mindset, like Carlo says, using data. And one thing that, again, can make you very persuasive as an economist is always um, using your data, you know, all of us are, are together in various groups. So we often encounter ourselves and everyone comes up and talks in those groups. We're all showing graph after graph of table after table. Like here is the data that supports my reason. Again, way more, it makes you so much more persuasive. A couple other things, the drive, what I call the drive for excellence, like that willingness to keep like going over your work, refining it, making sure your ideas are well worked out, that um, it's crisply stated, it's well communicated. That's the determination between being persuasive and not being listened to or not being asked back in the room. The other thing I would say is like the first 10 years of your career or so, your success or failure is about your analytical skills. How, how good are your economic skills? But ultimately your advancement and whether you go from, you know, sort of an individual contributor role or to a leadership role, and some people may be very happy, by the way, in the individual contributor role, has to do with your ability to marry those analytical skills with soft skills, with communication skills, written and oral, and interpersonal skills that are so important to get things done. I may not, I don't do any hand on the kind of metrics. Um, I need to understand enough to, to have people do things. And then I need to be able to deliver them in a way that people want, that want me in the room and they feel like I've made the complex accessible. That's right, that's right. Um, you went exactly where I was hoping you would go, Elaine, and, and really stressing the importance of communication, right? That, that all of us are good, need to be good communicators, both written and oral, right? And, and be able to explain sometimes very complex things. Um, in an easy way that the C-suite's gonna understand, right? The, the, the executives at the company. Uh, and that segues me over to the next question. And this, I'm just gonna make a jump ball question. So you, you will, I'm not gonna direct it to anyone, but how, how are economists seen at your company? 
I mean, you're talking to executives all the time, right? Giving them information about what you're seeing in the economy or your forecast or what other, other th- trends that you're seeing. How, how are you seen within the company? How are economists seen in general? Assuming they're called economists, I should I, I needed to put that asterisk up there at the beginning, which is that um, in the manufacturing sector, uh, we're all unique in that we have the title of chief economist. The reality, most manufacturers have other economists have different titles, right? They're in the strategy office, they're uh, doing something else, right? And they're maybe called analysts or something. But, uh, but given all that, how are economists seen in the manufacturing sector in general? What do you think? I could start us off maybe. Um, so I think, you know, one, you're absolutely right. Not everybody that does work that's related to economics is, is called economist. And that's important for, for people out there looking, you know, searching um, job boards, et cetera, you know, look for analyst positions, strategy positions, all these kinds of things can help at, at various places. Um, it's not, it's not always, you know, called economist, but so in our case, um, I think, we're broadly seen as a resource. Um, like I said, you know, the, the bread and butter of the company is to make airplanes and, and to bring them to market. And there are a lot of issues that senior executives have to deal with that are on that side of, of what's going on. They don't need me to, to tell them how to build an airplane. In fact, I don't know, right? But what we're doing is we're, we're guiding in terms of the marketplace and, you know, helping with communications with the, with the airlines out there and the leasing companies, um, sharing our view of the opportunities that are out there in terms of growth for, for air travel, um, also discussing challenges. And so in the end, what we do, we might not, you know, I, I don't go and talk to the CEO, uh, you know, very often it's, but I think our stuff that we produce makes it to that level. So we produce, you know, little videos, we produce briefings, we, we inform uh, processes that are set up within the company for for certain agenda slots in these in these meetings, right? Um, it's a it's a supporting role, but a really important one because this part of the company and this part of the interaction with the market that our senior executives have gets a lot more visibility. Right? We start saying also you know earnings calls. We have, there's a section on the market in there, um, and we try our best to inform that, and we try to really be the best in the in the industry at, at understanding the the business environment for for the um, aviation industry. So that's what it is. And ultimately, everything comes to us, and then it goes back up. Sometimes you know we go in person, but a lot of times our our things are really broadly, hopefully valued. Um, but they they go they go a long ways. Yeah, demand for our services keeps rising. So I think I think we're uh, making a good product. <laughs> we try to keep improving it. Uh, I think that, you know, our work is appreciated by lots of different constituents. So we're also an, you know, an engineering company, I think, at heart. We're also a super quantitative company. Like there's engineers, there's finance people, and there's salespeople. And there, there are others, but it's a super uh, quantitatively able company, which I think is great for talking in terms of data and, and stuff. But, you know, um, forecast guide, capital decisions, investment decisions, production decisions, nuanced discussion of what's going on in the economy and sort of the near-term outlook guides how people think about conditions. It guides how our our top leadership speaks about things. Um, And I mean, really, like Mary Barra in an interview with I believe it was the Wall Street Journal in the past 10 days that was asked about oil prices. And she said, well, I'll tell you what my chief economist thinks because she thinks about this a lot. That's nice. Uh, and, and But I again, I think they, they feel like we bring really good thinking. We're good at research um, and that what, and we're good at doing the deep thinking and then delivering it in a way that's accessible. And that makes us value. I I, I will add, uh, you know, something that that somebody mentioned to me at some point in time said, uh, we are the people in the crow's nest on the boat. You know, we are the ones who have kind of the peripheral vision of what is going on. 
And I think that that is something that that it's very much needed. It's, 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 it's like I said, how is the condition of the ocean is going to affect the movement of the boat? Okay. We know how to work the boat. We know how to crank the engine. We know how to steer it. But how is the condition of the ocean going to influence the, the, the movement of the boat? And I think that, that is something that, that we are uniquely qualified to do, and, and, and that is critically important. Um, it is, there is an expectation, I think, in our companies, as Jan was talking and Elaine for sure, uh, as well you, that we know <laughs> what's going on, that we understand what's going on. And, and, and our customers and our partners, our suppliers want to hear from us about how we are understanding the world, okay? And, and so it is, it is a huge responsibility uh, uh, to be an economist. I, I tell everybody that, you know, uh, uh, if I screw up, we're all screwed up in the sense that, that if, if the forecast for the business is not right, then the whole business suffers from that, okay? Because we're not gonna meet the, the targets that we set for ourselves. The, the, the outlook is not gonna be right. And, and that's really, uh, it, in my mind, a lot of the heavy burden of, of, of being an economist is that other people rely on you. And so as, as Elaine suggests, we have to be extremely careful and diligent about how we arrive at our conclusions and take responsibility for that, okay? We should be able to defend them uh, and, and, and with the people and help them understand why is it that we're saying what we are saying. So this is a question just to the to the three of you, um, just to jump ball again. Where do you process? What where do you where, where's the best sources for information and news, right? That you're going to be using when you're doing your forecast or looking at your sector. Where do you digest news? How much time do you spend processing information and news? Um, and so, I guess, where do you go for those kinds of types of things? And some of it can maybe internal, some of it might be external, but we're, 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 how much time do you spend processing news and information? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on the, on the pool first this time. I, I will say that, that you're looking at that. I think that what you need to build for yourself is, is a really strong network of colleagues. Uh, you know, if you ask me, why do I go to conferences? It's just to make sure that I'm not in left field all by myself. <laughs> you know, that, that I see what everybody else is thinking, what everybody else is saying, and to, to understand if I'm different, what I'm different, or if I'm in alignment, why am I in alignment? And so, uh, you know, shameless commercial in here, but, but going to the conference of NAVE and other groups of, of economists is, to me, is key to, to have a, a, a good perspective on what's going on. I like it. That was one of my next questions. So you've already said you've already went there, right? Which is which is professional development and, and professional organizations. I'll what about you, Jan, on or on this one, though. I, so one, I don't spend nearly as much time as I'd like digesting information. I, I wish I could read for, you know, three hours every day. Um, I would say that the first thing I prioritize is reading news. And I have on my iPad the uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, the two I find most valuable because there's they're just sort of more purely relevant information as the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. I tend to look at the journal every morning and then intermittently through the day. And I look at the Financial Times every evening. Um, things I, I find valuable, but I don't do nearly as much of as I'd like is reading. I get a lot of research reports from both a few consultancies to which we subscribe. And then I get some from um, economists at investment banks. Uh, so not daily, but I try to, you know, at least a couple of times a week, look through them. I look through, I have NBER send me information on, you know, new papers that hits my box every Monday. I, I try to glance through those and look at important ones. And yes, I, you know, one thing I think find really interesting in the world about business economists, as many of us are, are in smaller shops and there's a great network across, uh, you know, across companies and, and, uh, you know, so if I had an aviation question, I'd be like, Hey, Jan, can you talk to me for a few minutes? Um, and I think that's a great network that you can build through Nate. Yeah. I like that. And Jan, um, what about you? 
Yeah, it's very similar, I would say, to, to what Elaine said. I, I also start the day off looking at the news. Um, that is important um, just to see what's going on, even though, you know, it's not the daily gyrations of the stock market that determine the long term trajectory of a company. But it's, you know, there are some nuggets here and there. You, you kind of set out a, a forecast or a story and then you just take the news in terms of do they fit? Right. Does that lead me to alter my view? And so you always have to benchmark what you have against what the flow of data that's coming in, the news that are that are out there. So that's important to do. Um, and then we have, like Elan said, this is the same here. Um, we subscribe to some cons get data there. Um, and then industry specific things, right? Um, aviation um, newsletters. Because again, what you have to have is the connection between the economy and your industry. Um, I would, you know, I'm not interested in the uh, in the oil price as such. I'm interested because it's a huge part of the cost structure for airlines, and and influences their profitability and influences, you know, how much they have to buy airplanes or what it means for the value of airplanes that are more fuel efficient. So, you have to translate that all the time. And so, I'm looking at, at developments that are industry specific, not necessarily economic. I think that's just as important. You do both, and then you can make the connections. So, and by the way, I left out a couple sources that I use, but I want to mention that like something I read religiously that everyone can get for a couple hundred dollars a year is The Economist. Yeah. And The Economist, the, the depth and nuance of their analysis, the issues that you might not be seeing in, in major news sources that they raise to your attention, just a, a fantastic investment of time. I have a bit more global view too that than the newspaper right. perspective. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So one last question, and just a reminder to everyone who's watching um, that to put some questions in the Q&A, but I have one last here before I get to those. And that is, um, oh, uh, we got the Q&A. Oh, Q uh, so uh, my question is, just think for a second about entry level people that might be coming into Boeing or General Motors or, or Coca-Cola that is an economist, analyst, whatever, what, what advice would you give someone fresh, right? Who's just graduating with their degree, who's coming in and you're hiring them as an economist or analyst, what, what advice would you give them? Uh, and then I will, then I'll take the questions from the Q and A. Uh, so a jump ball, who, someone, whoever wants to answer that, what advice would you give to someone who is entry level economist or analyst? Okay, I can start while, while Elaine and, and then think a little bit about it. I'll take the risk. <laughs> um, you know, one of the greatest quotes that I have ever heard is, is what's the definition of insight? Is to see what everybody else sees, but to think something different. Okay, we all have access to the same data. Uh, and so, uh, the critical thing is, is, is when you're looking at all of this, is what is it telling you? I mean, it, it, like, like uh, Jan was saying, how is it coming alive for you? You know, what is, it, 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 we are all data whisperers. I, I mean, in, in reality is, is, is precisely that. How, what is it, what is the world trying to tell you? And, and, and it comes in, in, in the form of data. Uh, so, to me, that will be one of the of, of the critical things that as, as you start and and how do you get the, the data to talk to you? Well, you have to torture it. <laughs> okay, you 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 look at it from so many different angles and, and trying to find uh, a way of looking at it that that it, all of a sudden it tells you here it is. Okay. And, 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 and it doesn't come easy. Uh, you know, I tell people sometimes I sit in front of a bunch of data for eight hours and I come out of it and I have nothing to show for it, okay? But, but that's how you get at it. It's, it's, it's a lot of, of, of work to, to, to it's, it's not just like, so you magically like take a look at it and it happens. Uh, it's 99% it's perspiration for sure is, 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 is to try to, to, to get the data to talk to you. What about you, Elaine and Jan? In addition to watching, you know, how people sort of do the actual work, what data do they pull? How do they express it? I, I pay a lot of it. I would pay a lot of attention to how things get done. 
Um, how are things expressed? How does someone go about navigating the organization? Like, those are things you also want to learn for from, so you go from being able to, you know, sort of your school skills to um, being an effective professional and being, again, you, you've gone from studying from economists, talking to economists, to an environment where your job is to be the specialist and deliver it to people who are not economists in a way they can access it. How do you work the organization? Pay a lot of attention to the, the stuff that's not just economics because that's how you become effective as an economist as much as doing good economics. Great, great. Yeah, and if I can add, that can also mean not starting you know, at the position that you ultimately want to get to. Um, not everybody comes to the company, you know, a, a ready-made senior business economist. That is possible. But if you're fresh out of out of college, and you have, you know, maybe you can start in a in a different role, somewhere in strategy, somewhere in finance, um, where you get a different perspective on what's going on within the company, and then make that part of your story, right? And then reach out and communicate. Once you're in, you know, any of these big companies, you get a lot more visibility regarding opportunities and. You hear a lot more and, um, you know, you can approach it that way too. And the other thing I want to say is just, you know, focus on the basics and be confident. You know, you've most likely once you start the job had, you know, a very successful time in, in college or grad school, you know what you're doing. And then just check yourself for consistency. Focus on the basics when you do things, you know, um, is, is this visual that you're showing really, um, an output of the story that you want to tell, or is it something that just reflects everything you've done? You know? yeah. um, keep it simple. Um, focus on the basics in, in everything you do, and communicate a lot. Those are also things I would I would say are very um, valuable things to do. Right. Uh, yeah, and I will support Dan in all of this. I mean, in my career, I could work in operations, in marketing, in finance, and strategic planning. And, and that's what gives you that broad perspective to the business. And, and, and so I agree hundred percent with that. And, and as was mentioned earlier, <clears throat> you know, professional networking is important too, right? I think we've all, we all know each other through NABE, right? And that, that, that bond, if I, if I have a question about any of these, any of your industries, I'm gonna reach out to you on that. So if you have a question, make sure you type it in the Q and A. We have three questions so far. Uh, so I'm gonna. This is actually one that came in fairly early on, uh, and so it's probably going to get into your tortured data response here, Carlos. But <laughs> what's what's the best way to merge economic thought with a lot of those fancy machine learning techniques, and maybe more broadly, what's the best way to make prudent decisions? So, the uh, how are you using machine learning techniques? This is not just a Carlos. I just <laughs> said that with regard to the tortured data there. Uh, but also, how how do how do you what's the best way to make prudent decisions and using data and what you're doing? Mm. So I'll start. <laughs> so one, I have a, a few people who do econometrics and machine learning who have sort of more sophisticated toolkits and just the bandwidth. I've got I've got PhD an economist who do macroeconomics, but don't have the bandwidth necessarily to be doing a lot of econometrics. And so we, um, we go across different techniques to try to analyze complex questions. We look at multiple models whenever we can. Um, we do a lot of stuff through a program that used to be called LlamaSoft and has just become, been renamed Coupa that we found very helpful. It's kind of like having an RA. Uh, runs a bunch of different models and helps compare them and enables you to see all of the variables uh, that you are that are going into the model so you can sort of accept or reject them, not make conclusions based on sunspots, uh, as, as economists say. Uh, but, you know, we, we use models to found our forecasts. Our forecasts are often not straight out of the models. We do also apply expert judgment um, and, uh, if you show people a really bumpy long-term path, it'll confuse them. You probably want to smooth that even if the model produces bumps, for example. Great. Uh, I know, I know how much you're using machine learning uh, at General Motors and AI. Uh, 
uh, in general, how do you use, uh, how do you use data uh, to, to, to solve the tough challenges that GM or Coca-Cola or Boeing might have? Right. I guess that was the, I guess that's me just paraphrasing the question a little bit, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump a little bit on that. You know, um, if you're an undergraduate student, uh, again, it goes back to the tools. Um, you know, at some point in time, you know, we have all of these machines that make Coca-Cola restaurants. Uh, and, and the question is, um, if we want to start a program that uh, helps our customers, uh, the operators, with when the machines broke down. So, how many times are we expecting the machines to break down? Okay, and how can we figure this out? And you possibly remember from your uh, school days of the probability distribution for failure times for machines. Okay, or or for any other thing, and and how. This in particular distribution doesn't have a memory. The machine doesn't remember that it was just fixed. And so the time to the next failure is exactly the same. So the probability distribution of that. So this is where you have to be creative, okay? Uh, we all learn the same tools, okay? But how do you use them is, is, is where the genius of you comes into place and where uh, Jan was talking about being confident is, is that you understand your tools and, and, and then how to, to use them and mix them and match them so that you can come up with an answer, which is what Elaine is doing as well, is how can you bring it all together and put it in a way that people can understand? Because, you know, if, if they cannot understand you, they're not gonna listen to you. And that's the, the a, a critical part of the process. So that's a good segue into the next question, which is, you know, we've talked a lot about writing and communication skills, right? And how um, as economists, we need to be able to communicate big ideas, right? To, to often people in, in influence. You know, those are both skills that are required by the certified business economist certification, right? The CBE. Um, so with that in mind, um, the, the, the question would be, you know, how marketable do you think someone with a CBE would be uh, when, when they're applying for a job in the manufacturing sector, right? Again, given that they have the analytical skills, but they also have the soft skills that we've talked about uh, pretty extensively. To any, that's to any of you, not. So I, I mean, in a way that you, no, sorry, Elaine, you wanted to go first. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think, it, it, it speaks to that package that we said, right, where you have that unique combination in economists um, of, of being able to handle very technical information, but also communicating it. And, and you have to train that, practice that early. You have to start, like I said, when you're in school and you see things, like ask yourself, how do, is it applicable? What are the practical implications? Why am I doing this? Um, and, and then learn, you know, learning and, and, Practicing over time, that's that's it, it. Doesn't maybe happen in the first year or two. You you might need some experience in time, but it'll happen. And you know, find other venues maybe too to to learn communication in general. Um, you know, you can. There's tons of things. And if you volunteer or you're in resource group, you're engaged somewhere. Um, it doesn't have to be the the job in particular. For more, you know, some junior people have more technical job descriptions where it's more about updating data or pulling data or doing things, but you could do it outside of that too. learn, you know, leadership, communication, all these things. Um, I think anywhere you get this package of technical knowledge plus communication is, is good. And, and anybody that can show that is I think in general, a more attractive candidate. So I, I was on the NAE board when the CBE was put into place and was part of the initial class. And so I, I like to think that that gives me extra marketing, you know, uh, credential that I can put uh, on my resume. Um, uh, and, and I think that, that that's, that's the point, right? That, that we're certifying that people have these skills, right? And that is, is, is certainly something that has value. Elaine looks I like you're getting ready to say that, something. Though. I think it's more than that because, so I, I do look at it sort of similarly um, not as identical to a degree. It does say that someone has 
done some learning in how to apply economics in business, like very targeted versus uh, more um, academic training and less ideal of application. And I think the when you see things, you know, more training on someone's resume almost invariably speaks to like the drive to keep improving. Um, and that's always a great signal. Great, that's great. So I have a question here on causality, right? So, and data mining. So I'll read it here. In academia, questions come before data. I have the feeling that you might put the data first in business economics, given that you have a ton of it. That is what moves us from causality to data mining. Any advice, correction from your experience? Yeah, so I want to jump in here. So first of all, we have way too much to do to just like, you know, let the data lead to things or it'd be very rare that that happens. I mean, you might see something in the data, but in general, like we have a, a you know, a whole lot of questions to answer. So we're probably looking at data in a targeted way. There's some data we look at all the time and you may say, hey, there's something funny going on here. We have certain dashboards that we've developed to try to, um, in calmer waters than the current COVID waters, identify turning points and see things happening. Um, I think it's also worth noting, and this, this comes off a point Carlos made earlier, you can spend a lot of time working with data and, and sometimes, you know, you do work and, you know, your analysis, you, some of your analysis won't be valuable. You just have to be prepared that some of it you're just setting aside because uh, it, it, it didn't prove to get, help be insightful. So uh, here's a question that relates to promotions for the staff that you have, right? So uh, how do you approach, this is not directed at any one person here, how do you approach or design promotions? So I guess this is, I guess, a way of saying what makes a successful economist uh, in your eyes that they would continue to move up the chain? That's, that's me paraphrasing the question, but... Uh, any, any takers on that question? I'm, I'm going to answer, but, but not about, a, a, about an economist, but back when I was at Feral Express, we used to have an associate engineer, an engineer, a project engineer, a chief engineer, and a technical fellow. You know, and as you gain experience of work on more projects, you kept on moving up the ladder. Uh, I think that, that on the economy side, there is something similar. I mean, uh, I guess when you have a big team or a bigger team, uh, uh, experience, success, uh, uh, intuition, creativity, the same things that makes you successful professionally just doesn't matter what the field is, 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 is the same thing here. Is, is, uh, uh, how much do you become a part of the conversation? Is, is what starts becoming more critical. Because if you are a part of the conversation, it means that you are contributing to that conversation. And that is, 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 is a key thing for me. If, if, if I'm just there doing work and nobody's using it and, and there's no talk about, then you know, I'm just spinning my wheels. But, but the more you, you become a part of the conversation and, and it doesn't have to be a part of the broader conversation, if your boss is talking to you about what you're doing and trying to understand it and the whole thing, that is a good sign, okay? That, that you are bringing something that is of, of interest to the group. And I think that that, that is the piece. What is it that, that the team is working on? What is it that the organization is worried about? And, and try to, to, to participate in that conversation is, is a great way of, you know, advancing yourself, advancing the profession, advancing the, the, the understanding that you have. It's, it's I would say. Okay, great. I, I think it's important for us to think of that success is, is, is broader than just, just economics, right? If you're gonna be successful in your career, uh, those, are, those are all great uh, pieces of advice. Uh, so I have one more question here from the audience, and that is, uh, thanks was the question. Thanks a lot for the great advice. Uh, earlier, Elaine mentioned that the entry level people um, uh, to learn how things get done and what is the navigation. Are there more specific ways to do that, uh, like by reaching out to people? Um, also, uh, another question is, what advice do you have 
on how to prepare for an interview for companies. And so um, it's basically asking how do you navigate, I guess, as an entry level person, but also um, how do you reach out to people in terms of networking, but also how do you prepare for an interview? So those are, I guess, three questions on that bunch there. So I'll take the first part. So in terms of how to get things done, one is ask whenever you're not sure. Like you have, you know, ask how shall, you know, how should we get this done? You know, I actually don't talk to my boss very often in many cases, but when I talk to him, like the kind of high frequency, like, hmm, someone asked this, but this seems like awkward. How shall we navigate this? Um, you know, how to navigate things, internal politics, how to deliver a message in a way that'll be well-received, ask. Because some of these are some of the most subtle and nuanced things. So don't assume, ask. Uh, and so that's, I think, the best way to learn on that. The other thing is that relationships are priceless. And I know it's harder to form them now during COVID because a lot of us still work primarily from home. If you're in the office, you may need to be masked. It's not as natural to have meetings. But taking a little time to, to get to know people and develop goodwill makes it easier and more comfortable to um, ask a question or reach out to someone. And um, it creates a little more warmth and a little more interest and willingness on their part to help. And there are things you can do. You can ask people to do a Zoom or a coffee chat of some form. Um, and those relationships really prove priceless at getting things done. And of course, every organization is different in terms of you know, how, what's the right way to get together. So the final question that I'll do across the board here is um, a simple one, which is what did we not talk about, right? If there was one, what is your last word here? If you were to give some advice to someone who is an up and coming economist, something we haven't mentioned so far. So we'll start with you, Ian. Um, any last words from you? Yeah, I think, you know, if you're interested in becoming a business economist, I think and this is not just meant as a, as a commercially, but go to name events. You get the whole, you know, breadth of what you can do. You get people like us here on the webinar, but you get, you know, 150 to 200 more. They all have a story. They all have, I can tell you, right? And, and Elaine just mentioned the, the relationships and the, the networks. It's, it's that, but it's also knowing what to expect, right? Knowing what people do. And then find a match for yourself. See, hey, this is really exciting. I like what they're doing at that place or at this one. Um, just try to find out as much as you can. And if if a manufacturing company is is you know what you think um, is most interesting, then then you know talk to people, uh, stay in touch, just be um, interested. That's that's just what it is. And and don't assume what something is like. Find out. And once you know it, make the decision for yourself if that's what you really want to do, and then you can pour everything you have into it. Great advice. Uh, Elaine? There's no one path. Your path has to fit you, your, your preferences, your risk tolerances, your geographic uh, preferences, what's interesting to you. So, so follow a path that fits you. And if you're in, you know, find environments that you're going to succeed and you'll make your path. Good. And Carlos? You know, it's always good to meditate in some of these things, but I think that uh, what is it that the Delphi Oracle said? Uh, know it thyself. What is it that you like to do? Okay. And, and then go find a place. I sometimes make, make fun of this. Uh, I said our large corporations have a place for everybody. I tell them, if you like to paint murals, there is a place at Coca-Cola for that. You know, who's going to paint those big walls with Coca-Cola logos and stuff? Somebody has to do this kind of stuff. So in reality, it, you know, what is it that, that, that you like to do? And then uh, find a place. Sometimes it's, it's a matter of just getting your foot on the door. Maybe it's not exactly what you're looking for, but now you're in. Okay. And now you can explore this huge organization. And, and, and find out what is it that you really enjoy doing. And, and trust yourself. Trust that, that the logic that you learned, the training that you got, the data manipulation that you learned, all of these things uh, you know, are gonna help you. 
And you just have to go and place yourself in the middle of it and learn like we all did. And, and that's the, 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 I think the most important thing for me in, in, in somebody, if I was to hire somebody is a willingness to learn, you know, because that's what's gonna uh, help me as a, as a boss and, and it's gonna help the organization and it's gonna help. Yeah, we all have to be lifelong learners. Um, to be successful anymore. So anyway, this is this is fabulous. We're out of time. Uh, thank you for to Jan Hograff, uh, Elaine Buckberg, and Carlos Herrera for a great conversation. We could have kept going on, I think, uh, but our time is up. Um, so if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. And I'll turn it back over to Chris Jonas. Great, thanks, and thank you, Chad, and, and thanks to our panels for that fantastic discussion. Uh, the CBE webinar series will continue uh, in February. We will take a break in January, but we'll be back for our monthly CBE webinar series beginning with the first Wednesday in February. Uh, just, just as a reminder, if you do not have the Nave Connect app, you can download it now at the App Store. All webinar replays are available through the Nave Connect app. Also, if you're a Nave member, you can go to nave.com and watch the web all webinar replays on the nave.com digital archive. Okay, that does conclude the event. Thank you all again for connecting today, and we will see you next time.